and then start by introducing our one of our keynote speakers, Rick Young, uh, with an introduction. So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Rick Young uh, to you. Um, I'm sure you all know him for all his wonderful contributions to science. And I'm sure I do not do him justice if you want in this introduction, because I will need at least half an hour, if not an hour, to talk about all his many discoveries and his impressive career. Uh, but let me try just in five minutes to say something meaningful about uh, Rick and his career. Uh, so as many outstanding uh, scientists, uh, Rick has trained in excellent laboratories, and I would say probably uh, he made them excellent as well. And he has made uh, many remarkable discoveries throughout his career, in particular the understanding of uh, transcription, how eukaryotic transcription is regulated. So Rick obtained his uh, bachelor degree in 1975 from Indiana University, where he worked on phase RNA replicases. And of course, not surprising, I guess, he already published his first papers when he was a bachelor student and he was only 20 years old. And since then, Rick has published a large number of excellent papers with a very, very high frequency in the most prestigious uh, journals. So uh, Rick moved to Yale University uh, where he obtained his PhD in, in 1979, uh, you know, uh, 25 years old. Uh, you know, he sounded like an, a British student and not an American student here. And he was in the lab of uh, John Stites, uh, who you probably also know, and they're working on regulatory signals in uh, ribosomal RNA operants of E. coli. And you have to think these were other times. These were the time where DNA sequencing took off and Rick published several papers here again, including a couple of papers in, in a journal called Cell, uh, one in PNS uh, and other papers on the regulation of E. coli ribosomal RNA. And so many, many great scientists at the time, of course, they had their start of their career working on E. coli, and then they moved to yeast and then probably to mammalian cells. And Rick was uh, not so much different uh, from let's say, what the big trend was at the moment. So it was indeed exciting times. Uh, to put it into a historic perspective, these were the times where DNA sequencing was invented, RNA splicing was discovered in the same year. And so there was a lot of interest in how transcription uh, was actually regulated. And Rick moved to uh, ISRIC, uh, which is now part of EPFL, uh, in Lausanne in Switzerland to study gene expression mammalian cells. And he and his colleague uh, looked at tissue specific expression of a gene called mouse alpha amylase and showed that expression is actually indeed encoded by the same gene. And as I said, you have to know that it, we didn't know the, the sequence of the genome. We didn't know the genes. Uh, so these were actually big discoveries because we didn't know what we were looking at at that time of, you know, of, of science. From Switzerland, uh, Rick moved to uh, Stanford and to work with Ron Davis. Um, Ron Davis is now standing an ethicist and also inventor. And in short time, Rick also invented a method for expression cloning uh, using Lambda DT11 cDNA expression libraries. Uh, it's a great method if you haven't tested it. I mean, I actually used it as part of my career and, and the this way we cl I cloned E2F, uh, E2F1. Uh, but it was in initially invented for using for antibody screens so you could actually identify the cDNA for the proteins you're looking for. And, and one of the first thing uh, Rick used it for was to clone uh, subunits of yeast RNA polymerase two. Rick also got interested in uh, infectious diseases, and he also used the, the method to identify protein antigens from mycobacterium lepra and uh, mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis. And if you do not know, actually Rick has for many years had a great interest in immunology, which has been a big part of his lab uh, throughout his career. I'm not sure he's so active anymore, but you know, he has been also very active in, in HIV research uh, in the mid 80s and in the 90s. So to something you probably know much more about, Rick was uh, recruited to the Whitehead Institute in 1984, uh, which was founded a couple of years earlier uh, with David Baltimore as uh, the director at the time. And at Whitehead, Rick continues his two lines of research, one focusing on infectious disease and monology and the other one on what we're talking about today, the regulation of eukaryotic uh, transcription. Uh, 
I'll just mention some of the highlights from many contributions of Rich. Uh, he worked on, and now I'm interpreting, I don't know, but I mean, he worked on as many, on the assumption that transcription is regulated at the step of initiation and therefore focused on defining the RNA polymerase to complex and the associated proteins. And one of the first discoveries made was actually identify what was known as the SRB complex and now known as mediator. Uh, later, he, uh, of course, has been known as also still known for that, for his, uh, you know, to basically early knowing the power of doing genome-wide studies and systems biology. And one, I think one of his key papers, which was published in Cell in 1998, uh, with the title, Dissecting the Regulatory Circuitry of a Eukaryotic Cell, uh, Rick's lab used uh, high-density oligonucleotide arrays to determine transcription effects of mutating RNA polymerase II and genes associated with, uh, with RNA polymerase II. And there actually you could use these arrays to understand suddenly the meaning of many different subunits and how they will regulate uh, gene regulation. And we didn't know that before at all. It was very difficult to do these type of studies. He also uh, had a very big impact on the development of the chip technology. It was invented. Uh, in the early 90s, but it was a very tedious uh, approach which involved the cloning of and the sequencing of individual DNA fragments. And here he uh, fast realized that he could use these arrays to actually use them for what was known, which was known as chip on chip. And earlier in the conference, uh, you actually met Bing Ren, who was the first author on one of those studies, which were published in Science in 2000. A great technology, of course, now is chip sequencing, but you know, at that time it, it actually developed the field enormously. So the last couple of things I would like to say about Rick is that, so uh, after he had been at, at Whitehead, perhaps, uh, you know, for 20 years, he started to uh, collaborate with one of his colleagues, uh, Rudolf Jenisch, uh, and I think they found that partnership about, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago. And I think this uh, collaboration, which is continued today, has had a very big impact on, uh, for the science done, not only in Rick's lab, but also in Rudolph's lab. And Rick started working on embryonic stem cells and has since then uh, focused on the main cells. And this work has led to the demonstration that, uh, you know, big impact on understanding how the core stem cell transcription factors, OCK4, NANOX, OCK, uh, MIC, and so on, control gene expression in embryonic cells and how they regulate self-renewing uh, capacity of these cells. In recent years, Rick has also introduced new concepts in science. For instance, uh, introduced the term super enhancers, uh, defined as you probably might hear here about today, as large clusters of gene control elements that play essential roles in regulating cell identity. Rick Lab has also showed that cancer cell uh, super enhancers are especially vulnerable to transcriptional drugs. And now what uh, the topic of today is uh, what uh, Rick's lab has also started working on is uh, the suggestion that regulation of genes occurs in nuclear bodies also called transcription condensates. So finally, I would say that uh, Rick, of course, has received numerous awards for his many outstanding contributions to science. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences National Academy of Science, of Medicine as well. And uh, Rick has also had time to, you know, found uh, several biotech companies. I count, I know at least the four of them, uh, which have been founded by Rick. And if you don't see an airplane over your head someday, you may actually be Rick flying around over your head because he's also a pilot. So, <laughs> With this introduction, I would like to welcome you uh, and introduce you all to Rick Young. Rick, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. We're looking forward to your, your talk, which I'm sure would be great. Thank you very much. Christian, thank you very much. And, and <laughs> I, it sounds like I should retire here pretty soon, um, I, but I really appreciate the opportunity, Anya, Yang, Christian, to, uh, to talk to you today about uh, this subject. So let me just um, put this in the right mode. So I'm going to talk about nuclear condensates in gene regulation and disease pathology. And uh, I've separated this into three topics. 
biomolecular condensates. I'll tell you a little bit about how we think about uh, these bodies and cells. I'll try to relate this to how dysregulated transcription occurs in cancer. And then I want to tell you about a discovery that we reported recently that I think is really game changing for the pharmaceutical industry and connects it in a profound way to the epigenetic studies that many of us are involved in. And so my uh, conflicts up here listed is um, a founder and board member at Ciro's Camp 4, Omega, and DuPont. You know, I've been so inspired in my career by the crystal structures that have been produced by great structural biologists. And I don't have to tell you that Patrick Kramer is among the best of those structural biologists. A chemist by training, he, his structures have really been inspiring to many of us. But Patrick knows, and I've had these wonderful conversations on this subject, that in order to create these structures, you often cleave off the segments of proteins that we call it intrinsically disordered. They can interfere with this process. And you know what we've come to understand uh, is that the the many of the proteins involved in gene regulation, uh, and perhaps thirty percent of the human proteome uh, encodes proteins that do not form structurally stable uh, uh, proteins. They, uh, they form uh, very dynamic structures. And many of these proteins actually have both types of domains. And the classic transcription factor is a protein that binds DNA through its DNA binding domain. And there are dozens of such DNA binding domains that have been crystallized with their cognate binding site on DNA, but they all also have an activation domain. And that activation domain does not form a stable structure. Indeed, no mammalian transcription factor activation domain has ever been crystallized and solved at this level. And it turns out that these portions of proteins um, have a physical chemical nature uh, as a polymer that they will engage in condensate formation. In fact, all of the biomolecules that we study, DNA, RNA, and protein are polymers. And uh, these polymers will, through weak interactions, overcome entropy. And classically, we think of two protein molecules interacting at a structured binding site with relatively high affinity. But in addition to that, we have these portions of proteins, as exemplified by activation domains, that are disordered or oligomeric. And they have features that are different than the stereospecific high affinity interactions with defined stoichiometry. They'll allow multiple proteins, hundreds of proteins, to interact in a very dynamic fashion, low affinity. And the, 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 the view that the physical chemists have of the way that they form these condensates is either through electrostatic interactions or uh, homophobic interactions, they will um, form through large numbers of low affinity interactions. And it's evident now from the literature, especially the literature in the last three years, that almost everything we've studied in great detail from a genetic or biochemical point of view has been found now to occur at least part of the time in the cell in a compartment that we'll call a biomolecular condensate. And these are compartments that do not have membranes. And we miss them mostly because um, they do not have this nice refractive index that the lipid uh, membranes create in uh, microscopy. 
But what, what can we learn from condensate models that aren't solved by conventional molecular genetic biology? Well, first of all, I can't believe I, I taught at MIT for 30 years and allowed my students to believe that diffusion of proteins allowed them to find there are dozens or hundreds of functional partners in any kind of an efficient way. And just assume that by partitioning nuclear proteins in the nucleus versus cytoplasmic proteins, that eventually they'd, they'd find their, their drinking buddies. But it's just not the case. The, these condensates allow selective compartmentalization and concentration of components to create effective functions. And because it's a property of matter, it allows cells to evolve new functionalities through uh, modulation of these IDRs. So the roles of many of the diverse modifications that we know, DNA methylation, RNA modification, protein acetylation, deacetylation, these are all condensate partitioning regulatory properties. So in addition to the very nice, actually gorgeous work that's been done historically, say on histone uh, modification with readers, writers, erasers. Um, there are regulatory properties of modified polymers that alter the, their behaviors and condensates. And there are other features I don't want to go into great detail, but there are, we now understand, disease mechanisms that are not explained by the conventional lock and key models and new therapies that have been inspired by understanding condensate behaviors. I got into this with really two extraordinarily talented people, Phil Sharp, who you'll know as someone who was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on splicing, uh, Rup Chakraborty, a physicist, theoretical physicist at MIT, when students of ours, graduate students of ours, began asking hard questions about problems we didn't fully understand, the activation domain or transcription factors. Uh, you know, we classify transcription factors by their DNA binding domain because we've known so little about the activation domain. Why do enhancers cluster at genes that play especially prominent roles in cell identity? Um, why is there so much apparatus? Why, uh, as has been shown by several labs, can en enhancers activate genes without actually contacting them within close proximity, then only getting within 200 nanometers of a promoter? And the answer to this, I think, is that all the activation domains we've ever examined in mammalian transcription factors will form condensates with mediator and RNA polymerase to they do this at the super enhancer low side. They probably do it at other enhancer low side. It's just the size of the condensates are smaller. And the smaller the condensate, the shorter its half-life. So these are very dynamic um, enhancer puncta you can see in this movie that are forming and dissolving. Um, they do this on sort of minute long time frames. And what really persuaded us of this model is that precisely the same transcription factor activation domain residues that are required for interaction with mediator condensates are required for gene activation in vivo. There's a perfect one-to-one -one relationship. And so a model that we like to think about when it comes to super enhancers is shown here, where we have segments of DNA with enhancer uh, transcription factor binding sites, bind multiple molecules of transcription factor, that's nothing new, but are brought together through interactions with the IDRs of many of the components of the transcription apparatus. And I'm just trying to represent this on the left where each of these factors, the transcription factors themselves, the mediator, uh, P300 is, uh, it has the same feature, RNA polymerase too. They all have structured domains, but they all also have very substantial disordered domains. And as far as we can tell, all of the components of the transcription apparatus that have been described so far find their ways into these condensates. And that helps explain to me transcription factor activation domain function, 
how hundreds of different transcription factors can interact with a single type of coactivator complex and why in fact an enhancer um, can activate a gene without coming any closer than 200 nanometers. These condensates can be up to about 300 nanometers in diameter. And as you know, this beautiful work out of Mike Rosen's lab is just touching the surface of what I imagine is a beautiful uh, component to chromatin, and that is the way that various nucleosomes with their histone modifications are involved in different types of condensates that reflect the types of chromatin uh, modifications and structure that we've described in the past. And if you look at the history of histones, it's pretty evident that these N-terminal tails that are the site of the majority of the modifications, those are the IDRs of the nucleosomal histones and so what I've told you so far about IDRs and multivalency, low affinity interactions, the modifications that lead to selective partition, that is all being deployed here in chromatin. Now, there's some controversy around this, but it, it turns out, and this is just for a little uh, education, there's no debate over whether or not these bodies occur, whether or not they're membrane-less, whether or not they're playing functional roles in the cell. There's a debate over the exact physical process by which they form and whether or not they're all forming by what's called a first-order phase transition. You can prove first-order phase transitions in vitro and simplified systems with purified components in a living cell, it's using ATP to get jobs done, highly dynamic. These are non-equilibrium processes, not well described by thermodynamics, which is, is modeled, is mathematically described by equilibrium processes. That is, that the thermodynamics I grew up with is not sufficient to model these non-equilibrium processes. So we'll see how this turns out, but I think Ibrahim Sisi has some of the most compelling evidence that there are first order tra phase transitions in cells, that liquid-liquid phase separation as it's being described is what is the dominant mechanism that forms these things. But future science, future, future soft matter physics will resolve these issues. For now, what I want you to remember is that condensate formation is a property of matter. It's a property of polymers. It's actually been known uh, to occur since the 1950s. Uh, there's been quite a bit of work on what were called complex coacervates long before the year 2000. But it's been folks like Tony Heim and Cliff Brangwine, Mike Rosen and others who brought this into biology. And I think what this does is it provides cells with regulatory properties in addition to those explained by conventional lock and key mechanisms. It doesn't refute anything about those mechanisms. It simply adds some new and interesting properties. So what are some of these new and interesting properties? And to talk to you about this, I just want to talk to you about dysregulated processes in cancer. And I'm just using this slide to point out that we believe because of recurrent mutations in a variety of cancer cells that almost everything involved in epigenetic control, whether that's transcription factors, whether it's DNA, whether it's cofactors, histones, histone modifiers, RNA polymerase itself, all of these components are altered in one cancer or another. And because of the recurrent events, it's believed that they're playing a functional role in cancer. And one of the reasons I became interested in, in the condensate space is because it helps better explain some of the phenomena we've observed in cells than lock and key models. So one thing that helps us understand is these absurdly large super enhancers that tumor cells will evolve on driver oncogenes. So a typical super enhancer in most of the cells we've studied, most non-tumor cells is, is uh, 
is maybe 20 kb but the super enhancers in tumor cells can be 200 or 300 kb of dna occupied by transcriptional components and now what i suspect is you're getting a huge compartment that that filled with all of the components necessary for dysregulated oncogene expression. A really shocking and interesting phenomenon that, that's been observed now in a variety of tumor cells is that small indels that will create the binding site for one single molecule of a transcription factor will form a super enhancer at a site where there was no enhancer activity whatsoever. And what we now come to understand is that this these extraordinarily cooperative events that occur are events that are typical of phase separation. The movement across a phase separation boundary only requires the tiniest uh, bit of energy, and that can be supplied by a single transcription factor binding event. And tumor cells have exploited this to activate genes that are oncogenic and were otherwise silent in their normal cell of origin. We've now come to understand that signaling factors like beta catenin, which, which is just really a bunch of repeats flanked by IDRs, that the reason that these signaling molecules like to go to super enhancers is because they love to partition into these super enhancer condensates. And that seems to be true for all the developmental signaling factors, which also are involved in proliferative signaling. But the thing that's remained a mystery to me is why super enhancers are so sensitive to perturbations by transcriptional drugs. And we first noticed this together with Jay Bradner with his famous JQ1, this bet bromodomain inhibitor, or to our surprise in some multiple myeloma cells, there were very selective effects at super enhancers driving the MEK oncogene. And these effects we saw in many other kinds of tumors using different sorts of transcriptional inhibitors. I'm gonna briefly cover why we think that's happening now. So there are two really important criteria that affect drug discovery, the pharmacological activity of a drug, pharmacodynamics, that's target affinity, and its specificity, the selectivity of a small molecule for its target protein, typically. The other thing we were about is pharmacokinetics, and that's adsorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. But distribution, to me, is a, an especially important issue because we've historically just imagined that once drugs get in cells, they do like we imagine proteins do. They just diffuse around and they find their targets eventually by that diffusive process. But these condensates I've been telling you about, modeled in tissue culture cells, actually occur in normal cells in the tissue of human beings and they occur in their transformed cells. As you can see here, with normal breast tissue and malignant breast tissue. And what's interesting about these condensates is you can reconstitute very simple model versions of them with what are called scaffold proteins. So these are proteins that, are, that have come to be known as the scaffolds because they seem to play dominant roles in the formation and dissolution of these condensates. So what I'm showing you here, for example, is MED1 and BRD4 as scaffolds of what we call transcriptional condensates, these condensates that form at super enhancers. And what you can do with these so-called droplet assays is you can add a small molecule and see what happens. And it's very easy to do with um, drugs that have fluorescent properties. So here's fluorescine. We add that small molecule, which in this case is colored red. And what you can see here is that fluorescine is really diffusing through all of these droplets and not really being concentrated in, in to any significant extent. So we, we call that, we measure the quantitatively that property through what's called enrichment ratio. And the enrichment ratio is here pretty much close to one with fluorescine 
with small molecule dextrans, with hook stain, et cetera. But now when we go and we look at drugs, and mitoxantrone is a classic anti-cancer drug. It's not used widely but now because it's fairly toxic. It is used for prostate cancer. Long been known to concentrate into nucleoli. Well, the two scaffolds in nucleoli are Fib1 and MPM1. And look at what's happening. Mitoxantrone is concentrating itself in those two condensates. It also concentrates in MED1 condensates. These are much, much smaller than nucleoli. And so you don't really see them easily inside these cells at the top of the live cell imaging. But you can tell that it's being concentrated. And here, here's quantitation of the enrichment ratio. So this inspired us to begin looking at other anti-neoplastic drugs. Cisplatin and its um, and the platin compounds are the most widely used anti-cancer drugs. They're used in one in five cancer patients around the world. And look what's happening. It's concentrating in MED1 condensates. And you can see the quantitation over here that that, uh, that enrichment ratio is about 15. But when we, because fluorescence is actually suppressed in these condensates, when we actually measure using other techniques, the extent of the concentration, it's being concentrated 600 fold in these MED1 condensates. But it's highly mobile. It's not, it's not binding with high affinity. It's mobile and you can tell this by doing a photo bleaching experiment, seeing the rate at which the molecule comes back in. And uh, so we think that those interactions are very transient. So we're interested in the chemistry of this. And we went to Young Tae Chang, who's been creating fluorescent molecules with a variety of R group derivatives where he can add various functionalities. And that would allow us to compare and contrast the way a library of these functionalities will work with, um, with MED1 and with other condensates. And what we were able to do is to discover with this library that it's compounds with aromatic rings that are concentrating themselves preferentially in these MED1 condensates. And the compounds with non-aromatic rings were not doing so. That made us very curious. If it's aromatic rings on chemistries that are concentrating themselves into MED1, then it's probably pi-pi stacking interactions or pi cation interactions with amino acid side chains. And so that suggested that aromatic amino acids in MED1 are important for this. And we mutated lots of different amino acids, but it's the aromatic mutants of MED1 that you can see on the left have lost this property of concentrating the top hits in those small molecules, and yet it still forms condensates. Similarly, cisplatin is no longer enriched in these MED1 condensates, but the aromatic mutants still form these condensates. So we can separate the condensate forming property, which we've showed some time ago, is actually, in, it's, it's a serine patch that's really important in MED1 for this. We can separate that property from the property of concentrating cisplatin. Well, okay, so we can do a test. Will it preferentially, plat it platinates DNA, and intercalates platinates DNA, always thought to be fairly general and thought to work actually by damaging DNA and for cells that are proliferating, creating a challenge to DNA damage repair. And what we're able to show is that um, DNA, which readily goes into MED1 condensates, and as a control, readily goes into HP1 alpha condensate, condensates. So cisplatin is preferentially going into the MED1 DNA condensates, platinating that DNA much more effectively than it is in the HP1 alpha condensates. In fact, in the HP1 alpha condensates, there was no more platination than we'd, we'd obtained without HP1 being present. Well, what, what if we go into a real cell? Well, we can't detect the cisplatin in a real cell, but we can detect its product, platinated DNA, because there's a nice high affinity antibody for that. 
And what we found, and these are just duplicate experiments, is that when we image where MED1 is, so that's where the super enhanced recondensates are, we always saw platinated DNA. By contrast, when we image HP1 alpha, we don't see platinated DNA. Or if we image the DNA that's in nucleolar condensates, we don't see platinated DNA. And furthermore, if we just did chip seek with this antibody, what we found was that the platinated DNA is highly enriched with the super enhancers, much less enriched than typical enhancers and not enriched at all in sequences that have low HCK27 to settle. If we let that platinum treatment go for a longer time, then what it does is it leads to the loss of the MED1 condensates in these cells. It doesn't lead to the loss of other condensates as illustrated here by HP1 alpha. So that led us to ask how about other drugs, uh, drugs that are either tool compounds or are widely used. This is a fluorescent derivative of tamoxifen. And in each case, we found that these are being concentrated in MED1 condensates independent of the property of binding their target. So for example, this BRD4 condensate is actually not all of BRD4. It's a, it has neither of the BET bromodomains. So JK1 is being concentrated by a property that's independent of its binding to its target. Same here for MED1 and tamoxifen. There's no ER present in these specific condensates. So the concentration is a property that's independent of its target being present. So now what we think is happening with these clinically important drugs is they're not just diffusing willy-nilly throughout the cell. They're finding its way into compartments where the key activities lie. And because many of these anti-neoplastic drugs are concentrating into MED1 condensates, and as I've shown you, there are super enhancers that are being formed at the driver oncogenes it's these driver oncogenes in which you get on target activity that of compounds that may be concentrated nearly a thousand fold greater than anywhere else in the cell. So what this leads us to is a claim that I made very early in this talk, which is that this phenomenon should allow us to improve what's called the therapeutic index, the concentration at which a drug works versus the concentration of which it's toxic. And what I'm excited about is the possibility now that we can actually discover what would be called the physiochemical codes, the codes that describe the functional chemistries that find their way selectively into certain condensates that concentrate drugs at those sites so that one could bring a warhead designed to target a specific protein or an RNA or even DNA uh, to the site in the genome where a condensate had been formed by these physiochemical processes. So I'll just close by thanking this incredibly talented lab, especially this last part, Ann Boja, Isaac Klein, Lena Fay, and Alessandra Dalignesi, and Susanna wilson Hawken. These uh, folks are just the remarkably talented, but I'd like to point out that none of this work and, and none of the work that Christian reviewed for you at the beginning could have been done without really talented collaborators. And I think it, any success I've had is actually due to this combination of extraordinary collaborators and extraordinary students. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rich, Rick. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, wonderful talk as always. Um, we have a good number of questions for you. Uh, these are some of them listed here in Q and A session. Uh, I would like to start with one until you know we get some more in. So one of the questions I had for your uh, specific interactions with super enhancers. Do you think that it has to do with the open structure of the DNA as well, or do you see any enrichment on, in open 
let's say open chromatin as such is that one of the the let's say indication for this enrichment or do you think it's actually the formation of the condensates which are actually leading to the enrichment yeah it, it's a great question christian and, and it, it it forces <laughs> it's a question i've asked myself many times because uh is the chromatin open because of condensate behaviors that may be transient and you know not so easy to detect um, in a cell population or are there open areas of chromatin that have nothing to do with condensate phenomenon and so that's why i find it challenging to answer your question my suspicion is that both things are happening that you have transient condensate formation is very dynamic they form and dissolve in minute time frames and there are what we think of as longer term epigenetic features of the dna that might not require uh, a condensate behavior in order to be open to drug action and one would perhaps uh, think there would be a difference between DNA intercalating drugs and, and those which are targeting directly proteins, I assume, as well. Yeah. That, that may be the case. I guess one of the reasons we focus so much work on cisplatin is because the condensate modeling we did was without its target, DNA. And that, could, that allowed us for a while to separate those two activities, the activity of concentrating cisplatin in a non-DNA uh, context and the activity of it intercalating DNA and having its platinating uh, function. Great. So let's go to some of the Q&A questions. There's one here from Palabi Mustafi. Uh, he's a PhD at in, uh, yeah, Indian Institute. I can't remember the name. He says, amazing talk could be a very broad question. Do you think condensate property has been evolved by nature in organisms to add the fine layer of regulation in their biological functions or, and do you think the differences in biophysical properties of these condensates could be contributing to the specificity? Okay, this is a, a brilliant question. Um, and the answer is just simply yes. The uh, Phil Sharp and Rup Chakraborty have uh, written a paper in PNAS where they make the argument that condensate properties have allowed cells, have given cells an extraordinary capability to evolve. And that the differences in the physical chemical properties of condensates are contributing to specificity. So the way I think about specificity, especially in the nucleus, is DNA is an incredible organizing principle. Uh, selective binding of specific DNA sequences is, is fundamentally important. And then you combine that with some degree of partitioning specificity. That specificity is exactly as the questioner suggests. It's a, it's a, uh, a soft, fine layer of specificity that where we've seen some evidence of separation, for example, of the MECP2 that goes into heterochromatin and the MED1 and BRD4 that likes to go into euchromatin, these don't like to mix at all. Good. So you have a lot of questions here, Rick. Uh, let me take the next one. Uh, Faison, postdoc in the Carrier Lab at UCLA. Uh, condensate models also true for typical enhancers. Does condensation drive promote the enhancer looping? And, I, and the answer is yes, but with this caveat. So the smaller the condensate, the higher energy it is. And the physicists like to think about this as, for example, um, the surface tension is higher for a smaller sphere. And molecules like to go to lower energy states. So where you have an opportunity to be in a high energy state, a small condensate, and a big and a low energy state with a, a big condensate, molecules will uh, migrate through something uh, uh, called Oswald ripening. And uh, so the small condensates will have incredibly short lifetimes. So we may not be able to see them 
both because of their smallness and their transient features. But the properties of matter suggest they are there. Okay. Next question is from Roxanne Verdict from she's a postdoc at UCLA in a law lab. Awesome talk, eye opener for me. About drug partitioning, what would be the dependence to dose and time? For instance, would JQ1 only remain in MED1 condensate, or would it change phase condensate over time, or with a certain concentration? Yeah, these are important questions, and I have to emphasize we're just at the very beginnings of the science that would fully answer that question. But I'll tell you what we know. We know that when JQ1 concentrates into a transcriptional condensate, that for a limited time, mediator and polymerase remain unaffected, but BRD4 is chased out of the condensate. So um, now having been chased out of the condensate over a period of time, mediator and polymerase are no longer able to get access to BRD functions, which of course include pause release, recruitment of CDK9 and pause release. So it disrupts the transcriptional activity, but it does it in a kind of sequential way. So these issues you're bringing up about dose and time, they're, they're very important in pharmacology and they're very important for us in trying to understand these underlying mechanisms. But we're just at the beginning. Right. Uh, next question is from Bing Ren. He says, hi, Rick. It was tru truly an inspiring talk as always. One question. Besides MED1 condensates, are other condensates also shown to enrich common drugs? So I showed an example, mitoxantrum, which is like cisplatin, another DNA intercalating agent. And it, it is really enriched in uh, the nucleoli. And this is actually why it's so toxic. Um, and Tony Hyman's told me that it also gets enriched in nuclear pores, which are also condensates. So it is being enriched in a variety of condensates and not in others, again, by properties we don't really understand. So uh, you're, it's a prescient question. Um, we don't see the reason we think that BRD4 and MED1 don't mix with HP1 alpha condensates is because HP1 alpha condensates are also MECP2 condensates. They go together in all the cells we've looked at. And you would expect that from the conventional models that have emerged over the last couple of decades. But MECP2's disordered regions have a very special property, at least amongst these things we looked at so far in that they will not co-mix with BRD4 and MACP2. Mm. So, so I was just thinking here, would that be an, an issue if you use 5 acer or other drugs where you actually target DNA methylation, which may not form condensates? What yeah. do you think about that? I, I think it's a great experiment to do. We haven't done that, but that, um, you know, as, as you're pointing out, MECP2, prefers to bind methylated DNA. And we see that in condensate formation as well. So modification of the, the DNA methylation state changes the heterochromatic condensate in our, in our experiments. And a way to think about this, it kind of excites us, is much like, trans, like enhancers seem to serve to concentrate transcription factors, and in the condensate world, when something is concentrating a protein with IDRs, it encourages the formation of condensates because it pushes it over that threshold for condensate formation. So methylated DNA is increasing the crowding of MECP2 and stimulating the formation of these condensates. You alter that methylation, you alter the physical chemistry of those condensates. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Let's take this one. Franziska uh, Groilich, uh, she's a postdoc at the Technical University in Munich. Very inspiring talk. Do you think that proteins similar to drugs encode specific motifs within their IDRs to be targeted to specific condensates? 
great question. There is an inspiring paper from Tony Hyman's lab that has examined almost every amino acid side chain and its contribution to what uh, he has termed the molecular grammar of FUS, so fused in sarcoma, which is a well-known contributor to dysregulation in sarcoma cells as a, as a fusion protein. And so there are very specific amino acid side chains that produce quantitative changes in the promotion or, or suppression of condensate formation. So there really is a chemical grammar to these amino acid side chains, which probably is contributing to this, this specificity. And in fact, drug developers have in the past developed ways of screening small molecule peptides to get clues to the kinds of chemistries that might be useful to produce in a small molecule. So amino acid side chains are very valuable for this, these kinds of studies. Okay, I think we'll have to stop here and in the interest of time, you have many more questions, Rick, if you have time to answer some of them online, it would be great. Thank you very much. Will do. Thank, Thank you. you.